Hello, and welcome to this repeat performance of the Global Health Compound Design webinar. Uh, I'm David Coes. Uh, this There's a problem with recording, so there's no audience uh, for this presentation, so unfortunately you won't get any questions. Uh, but today I want to talk to you about a variety of uh, tools for structure-based drug design and virtual screening that uh, we've developed that are all free and open source. So of course, the task at hand is structure-based drug design, where we have a structure of the protein or the receptor that we're trying to design a molecule to bind to. And we, we usually know where we want it to bind. And the question is, what will bind here? Uh, and the general approach we take is this, this funnel, where you start from chemical space, either purchasable chemical space, uh, compounds you can buy, or accessible compounds they can easily make. And then we do use really rapid sublinear time, fast matching algorithms to identify uh, likely hits. And then we find and we rank them with protein ligand scoring algorithms. And ultimately I do think you need to uh, reduce the simplifying approximations you make in these earlier steps and incorporate the full dynamics of the system uh, through simulation methods and so on. Although I'm not talking about those today. We're looking at these first few uh, steps where you're making approximations like the receptor being rigid uh, and so on. And the questions we want to ask are, uh, how do these compounds bind? We have a structure of the protein. What's the structure of the ligand? Let's predict the pose. Uh, does it bind? That's virtual screening. And how well does it bind? Affinity prediction. So for these matching algorithms, we developed another of these fast uh, indexing algorithms that lets you really rapidly identify compounds that match a given uh, pharmacophore or shape. And these have been deployed in uh, this Pharmit web service that I'm going to describe. Now, it, uh, just to make sure we're on the same page, what a pharmacophore is are the essential features of the interaction. So uh, this is a 3D pharmacophore. It's, so it's not just what, what features are there, but where they are in space uh, and how they interact with the protein and where they are with respect to each other. So common features are aromatics, hydrophobes, uh, positive negative charges, hydrogen bond donors, and acceptors. And as it turns out, ATP has examples of all of these. And the question is, how do we get a pharmacophore, which is a set of such features in their arrangement? Uh, so there's a number of different approaches based on what data you start with. Uh, so ligand-only approaches, you don't have a receptor structure, you just have a collection of ligands that you know bind, and so you have to come up with some 3D alignment and sort of figure out what are the most common uh, features in that 3D alignment. And some examples of those are shown here. Uh, for example, Pharmagist is a free web server that you can upload a collection of ligands and it'll make predictions about what the pharmacophore is, assuming they're all active against the same target. Receptor-only approaches uh, are often simulation-based, is where you have the receptor structure and you're predicting what will be the interactions of a ligand, but you don't have a ligand. Uh, so simulation-based, you might simulate drug like small little probes, uh, like PharmMaker does. It's also a free tool. And, and you actually simulate with molecular dynamics and you see where do these probes cluster, where do they like to interact with the protein. Uh, more efficient and faster are docking-based approaches where instead of simulating where you have the full flexibility of the receptor and the solvent is you dock uh, usually against a, a rigid receptor. And FTMAP is an example of a free web service that will uh, dock a pre-selected number of small probes to identify these interactions. And at the simplest level, uh, there's uh, grids where instead of actually having a small actual molecular fragment, you just say, okay, I have a hydrophobic interaction point or a hydrogen bond donor interaction point, and you map out on a grid where they most like to interact with a protein. So all of these are methods for identifying potential interactions, and then you put those interactions together to define a pharmacophore. Uh, on the right here, I have an example where, where we actually did that successfully in a prospective drug discovery. Uh, we didn't actually use any of these uh, sophisticated techniques. We just docked some small fragments of benzene in water and uh, also used uh, the uh, residues of the protein interaction or charting. And we put these together to identify a pharmacophore that identified a, an active compound against this uh, target. Ideally, though, you have both a ligand and receptor. You have a structure with the a, a ligand bound. And then the problem becomes uh, relatively straightforward. You just look at it and see what the interactions are uh, in the uh, complex. 
And that's what Pharmit will do for you. If you, you can give it a receptor and a ligand says, here's the interacting features. And all of these approaches I say are reviewed in this uh, review down here that I wrote. So just to give you some examples of this, uh, the ligand only approach here is Pharmagist where uh, I am, uh, is an example targeting estrogen receptor alpha. And so I have this training set from this PubChem essay of uh, various compounds that are active against estrogen receptor and uploaded to Pharmagist and it produced this consensus pharmacophore from these compounds. However, when I test them against the uh, dude estrogen receptor target, which is a virtual screening benchmark, uh, it actually, unfortunately, in this case, this instance didn't do so well. So there really wasn't uh, much enrichment. So you have a pharmacophore uh, matching, you say, okay, within this uh, screening set, how many, what compounds match? For that subset of matching compounds, the question is, are there proportionally more actives than in the whole set, right? So if there's twice as many actives than is expected from the whole set, that's an enrichment factor of two. And you can see here, you're one or actually less than one. And these actually aren't significantly different than one. Uh, so in this case, uh, ligand base wasn't very pro uh, successful. However, when you do a receptor only approach, so here we don't have a ligand uh, or we aren't providing ligand to the method. Uh, and we upload the receptor to FTMAP and it generates a number of docked fragments, which are these uh, uh, thin sticks in magenta and, and blue. Uh, the estradiol, the green here was not there as part of this analysis, it's just there to show you how a, a compound actually does bind. And uh, it does in fact identify useful pharmacophores, uh, both in terms, if we give it a receptor structure that is bound to ligand, but without the ligand, and an APO unbound structure. In both cases, it actually identifies a useful enriching pharmacophore. So you have 10 to 20x enrichment uh, just using the receptor structure in this case. And uh, ideally, though, like I said, you have a, a complex already. And in this case, you can just upload it to Pharmit and it will just look you simple rules you know you have a hydrophobic group and uh, uh, right next to it on the protein are hydrophobic groups that's a hydrophobic interaction and so on so it identifies the interactions uh, and if we look at the best three or four or five feature pharmacophores identified through this approach you can see we get even better enrichments uh, so this is sort of ideal if you have the data and this is what you can do on pharma so now i want to uh, give you a demo of how Farmit works. Uh, this is a free online resource. It's open source, so you can actually deploy it yourself. And this is just my cheat sheet to remind me uh, to make sure I uh, show you all these features. Uh, so uh, here is uh, Farmit. This is the landing page. Uh, if you know the PDB, uh, you can just input it and uh, select the ligand. If there's multiple ligands, they'll show up here and uh, click submit and it'll automatically pull those apart and identify the interactions uh, like you can see here. Now this is pretty embedded so in, in the protein. So I'm going to uh, remove the surface uh, and uh, also change uh, the visualization here to be a binding site visualization. So you, which highlights uh, the binding site residues and uh, change the color there of the cognate ligand. Right, so you can really see what the interactions are here. And uh, I can then just search a library. So for example, this is uh, the Moleport library, which is a commercial library. It's an aggregator of many commercial libraries. So it's one place where you can uh, submit one PO to order from multiple vendors. Uh, and as you can see, this has over 100 million confirmations of, of 8 million molecules. Right. And, and we search that in a matter of seconds. These are all the hits among those confirmations. And we have several other uh, commercial libraries and also more uh, academic libraries like Kemble, and uh, where you can search for you know, compounds with known affinity. Uh, I'd like to highlight the MQ library here. This is really a unique resource, a lot of uh, made to order, but relatively speaking, uh, inexpensive made to order compounds. It's really a very different chemical space than you might get from Moleport. So if you're actually doing a virtual screen, I would encourage you to search several of these libraries because you are going to get 
different uh, results uh, because they're different compounds. Okay. Uh, so uh, just a few notes about how these uh, libraries are created, what exactly we're searching, uh, how do we prepare these libraries? Well, the input is smiles, just um, the smiles from the vendors. Uh, we do throw out very large compounds. Uh, in terms of uh, tautomerization, we, we just don't consider it, to be honest. The, uh, we just take the default open Babel protonation. So this might be something to consider in constructing your pharmaca for uh, that you should also try to match for alternative states. Uh, in terms of stereochemistry, if the smile specifies it, we stick with it. Otherwise, we sample. Uh, so uh, if you've ever had to prepare these sorts of libraries, you realize there can be this exponential blow up if you enumerate all the stereoisomers. Uh, and, and we don't want that. So we just sample during the confirmation generation. And in terms of conformers, the, the different you know, um, rotatable bonds and orientations that we have, uh, we sample up to a maximum of 20 and we use RD kit. And when I first started this, actually, uh, I, uh, I had a very exhaustive approach. I enumerated all the stereoisomers and I generate 100 or 200 conformers. And it turns out, at least from the standpoint of virtual screening, when you, know, you sort of want to be good on average, this is the wrong thing to do. Uh, because as you enumerate more and more conformers and stereoisomers, uh, that means there's more chances for the inactive, the invalid compounds to match your query just uh, through bad luck on your part. Uh, and it turns out the good compounds, for the most part, the uh, the right conformer, the best conformer is in your uh, small ensemble. Because when we generate conformers, we, we pick the lowest energy ones, right? And so when you're generating 100 conformers, you have a, a lot of not very good conformers. And this graph here is just a, something I did a few years ago to evaluate different RD kit uh, conformer generation approaches. Uh, and the point here is, it's organized by rotatable bonds, is you have to have a pretty darn flexible molecule until you can't with just a 25 uh, uh, conformer ensemble uh, where you aren't generating a molecule that is within two arms D of uh, the bound confirmation of that molecule in the PDB. So this is looking at PDB molecules, not looking lowest energy confirmation, but the actual bound to the protein confirmation. Like you can recapitulate that in these conformational ensembles and you don't need that many conformers. So that's why we only do up to 20 uh, because it, it works better. Uh, so uh, those are what we're searching for. And so we've generated these conformers and we're looking for these rigid body matches to these various features, which you can see you can define uh, the, the standard uh, features, aromatic, hydrogen bonds, uh, hydrophobic, positive, negative, uh, and you can set the tolerance sphere. Uh, I know I have the defaults to be different for each feature, so it's easier to visualize them, but I honestly recommend just doing one for all of them, but that seems to get the best results in most cases. Uh, you can turn on directionality constraints on hydrogen bond acceptors and also aromatics. I really don't recommend it because um, we are searching against these pre-generated conformers and they have pre-generated directions. And in reality, the hydrogen bond direction depends on the context of the receptor and that is not being taken into account. So you're going, uh, it's better to do any hydrogen bond discrimination as a post filtering step after the pharmacophore. So I recommend not turning this on. And you can easily add and uh, sort and uh, you know, enable and disable uh, features as you want. So you can interactively explore your pharmacophore hypothesis with respect to the library you're screening. Uh, another key point I wanna highlight are the shape constraints. So a pharmacophore is just matching what you want to be there. Uh, we also uh, sometimes want to avoid certain things, especially if I, I'll just uh, sort by molecule size. If you look at something like this, it's uh, clashing all over with the protein. This isn't something we want. We want to avoid things with severe steric clashes. And so you can exclude um, uh, sterics. Uh, the conventional way to do this is with exclusion spheres. You can have those if you upload um, you know, like an MOE pharmacophore with those, they, they will be loaded. Uh, but I think a slightly more sophisticated approach is to actually exclude based on the receptor itself. So here, this uh, blocky volume is places where we say we don't want any compounds that when they're aligned to the pharmacophore have the heavy atom center uh, overlap this blocky volume. 
And I can change this as a tolerance for how deeply into the protein surface my compound can penetrate. Because you want to have some, uh, some tolerance there because the, we're aligning these rigid conformers and then we can relax uh, and, and optimize the ligand conformation with respect to the receptor. So, you know, small clashes aren't really an issue. We can resolve those, we, but we want to get rid of the big ones like with this guy. And so if I search uh, with these steric constraints on, and so we get a lot fewer hits, we filtered out these uh, really large overlapping compounds. Uh, one other thing I wanted to point out uh, is uh, there's a dog here. That's very important. The dog, uh, she is going to probably stick her nose into uh, the presentation. Okay, but that's not really what I want to point out. What I wanted to point out uh, was in terms of how do we upload, if you don't have a PDB, uh, you can upload your own receptor. And under the features, that's where you can upload the ligand. You do need to upload them separately. If you have a complex, you need to separate it. And you want to upload the receptor first, uh, because then when you upload the ligand, it'll identify the interaction features. If you just like upload the ligand first, they'll say, here's all the pharmacophores. It won't, there's, there's no receptor for it to compute an interaction with. Uh, you can also, it doesn't have to be a ligand for these uh, load features here. You support a number of pharmacophore file formats that you can just upload in search. As you can see here, PharmaGist, uh, MOE, Lig Builder, Ligand Scout. Uh, a few other things here. Uh, so filters, uh, hit reduction, all these matches, uh, it's not just compounds, right? It's the conformers, but it's not just the conformers that we're matching. It's how we can align the conformer to the pharmacophore. So if you have like an equilateral triangle of uh, pharmacophore features, like three hydrophobes, there's many ways you can align the same conformer to those. If it matches, matches one orientation, you can rotate it 60 degrees and so on. And so you can have the same, not only the same molecule, the same conformer appearing multiple times in your hit list. So you can reduce this here. Also, if you only just want to have the, the one hit per molecule, then total number of hits. Uh, in addition to reducing the hits, you can filter by various sort of standard molecular properties of, you know, uh, you have no interest in looking at compounds above 500 molecular weight, then you can filter them out uh, right at the beginning. And of course, uh, we have an assortment uh, visualization. Uh, and you can load and save sessions. This is saving everything in here. This is at your pharmacophore, you know, everything we've built up here, your query, that is saving that. And you can restore it to, you know, uh, search again if you want. In terms of your hits here, you can uh, save them to an SDF. Uh, you can also refine them by clicking minimize here. This, we're no longer doing a rigid body alignment to a pharmacophore. We've already done that. We take that pharmacophore aligned conformer. And now we are doing an energy minimization where we are allowed to change the uh, torsions of the molecule. The receptor is still fixed, but the ligand uh, can be is being optimized with respect to the uh, receptor. And this gives us a score. This is from uh, the Venus scoring function. Uh, so more negative is better, it's an energy. And an MRSD, this is the minimized RMSD. This is how much that conformer has moved from the pharmacophore line pose. So presumably there's a reason why you specified the pharmacophore the way you did. You want the compound to match that pharmacophore. So if it's moving too much, then it's probably, even if it has a good score, you probably don't want it. So you might want to say, for example, filter out uh, all the compounds with an MRSD greater than two. Uh, and then you can save these minimized compounds uh, to your uh, hit list. And uh, one other thing to point out, uh, we have multiple libraries here. You do have to search them independently, uh, but they're all hyperlinked with each other. So for a given compound, and, and when you download, this will be in the file too, what libraries this compound is part of. So you can see this is uh, molecules and Kemble, so it probably has some binding activity. So you could actually check, is this actually an active compound, for example? All right, so uh, that's Farmit. And of course, uh, the success of a virtual screen really depends a great deal on this, on this scoring here, right? Even um, most people, certainly not in academia, are going to be able to test 464 compounds. You can only test the top. Uh, scoring compounds. And so that is where protein ligand scoring comes in. 
Uh, and so what I showed you there uh, in Farmit uses the auto doc Venus scoring function, which is shown here, which is a, a very simple and fast way to evaluate protein ligand uh, interactions. Uh, you have some steric terms, a hydrophobic term and a hydrogen bond term that results in these different potentials or different pairs of atoms. And we use that to do this local refinement, like you see here, where you can resolve some clashes and optimize the hydrogen bonds and stuff like that. Um, but since this is so key to picking your best compounds, the question is, can we do better? And this is something we've been working on a lot, is taking the pictures, that your, your structures, and putting them through a machine learning model and answering these questions about closed prediction, binding discrimination, affinity prediction. And our approach to this, the way we put this into a machine learning model uh, is to take cues from the image recognition community, only instead of uh, putting in a, an image, which is a 2D grid of red, green, blue values, we put in this, this 3D grid of, of voxels where instead of red, green, blue, we say carbon, nitrous, oxygen, we say what atoms are here in space, right? So this is a, a very low level uh, re representation of a molecular structure. Uh, and has some pros and cons using this uh, gridding approach. Uh, the biggest con is it's dependent on the coordinate frame, right? If I rotate my molecule, all of a sudden everything looks different. Like all the grid points are different. Uh, and from a machine learning models perspective, you just give an entirely new thing. It, it doesn't think they're equal, which is obviously not right. Uh, but this can be addressed a number of ways. Uh, you can use an equivariant convolutional net network or steerable uh, CNN. Uh, data augmentation, when we train these, we rotate them, rotate them, so the network learns that these are maybe not equal, but approximately equal, the, the rotated versions. Um, and in exchange, you get, I mean, it's a 3D picture, all the information is there. Uh, whether it's easy or not for the network to learn it, 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 the information is there, and it's super duper parallel, like this maps really well onto GPUs. And uh, everything in your representation maps to 3D space. So this adds ability to visualize and understand what's going on. I can back propagate information onto my input. So to generate these grids efficiently, um, we've developed this libmol grid Python package, which has a lot of uh, CUDA code and a lot of functionality for training models. Uh, so if you want to suck in a grid representation of molecular structure, you should check this out. You can do it very efficiently and effectively and then you can plug this into PyTorch or whatever your favorite uh, machine learning model is. And our model of choice are these convolutional neural networks, which are very successful with image recognition, where uh, there's the dog again, uh, where we apply these convolutions where you learn these local features. Uh, so you're learning a function of a local space and mapping on this feature map. And then you're uh, successfully learning higher and higher order features until you finally get, you know, this is a dog, this is a cat, or in our case, this is a uh, good low armistice pose, this is a bad pose, or this is a high affinity binder, this is a low affinity binder. Right, so uh, we've trained a number of models like this. This is some examples. Uh, this uh, DEF uh, 2018 has um, you know, five convolutions. This is not a big model uh, by any chance. Uh, uh, by you know, uh, modern deep learning uh, models, uh, but that's uh, advantageous because it's, it's relatively fast. And then we have this more computationally intense uh, dense model and we evaluate here where each green block has three densely connected uh, convolutions. So they're, um, you know, this convolution is taking the input of the, the previous two. Uh, so there's a lot of compute. There's more parameters, but there's even more compute here, but it has a chance to learn more complex features. And so these are the two sort of uh, ends of the spectrum of a simple and a complex um, and deep learning convolutional model. And when we evaluate these, uh, they do in fact outperform uh, Vena, uh, which is our, our baseline empirical uh, scoring function. So here I'm just looking at scoring poses uh, for affinity prediction. Can I actually predict the right binding if you are using PDB bind? You can check out the um, paper for the full details of the evaluation. But this line here is how well Vena does in terms of Pearson's R correlation. And then up here is how individual uh, models that we trained for DENSE and DEF 2018 are doing. Uh, so there's, they're different because training a neural network is a 
stochastic process. So we can train five models of different random seeds, we get different answers. And if we then take the ensemble prediction, the average prediction of all these models, that's uh, outperforms any single model. That's the triangle. And you can see we're doing uh, dramatically better, really, than mean affinity prediction, which, uh, to be fair, uh, Vena is not uh, primarily calibrated for affinity prediction. Uh, so maybe this was uh, low hanging fruit. What it is calibrated for is uh, pose prediction for actually doing the docking, getting the right pose. And here again, if you compare Vena, which is this line here, a little above 40% uh, to the uh, triangles, uh, about 60%, more than 60%, uh, we are outperforming Vena. And this, when I say top one here, what I mean is I, I, I dock and I have a bunch of poses and I have, uh, I've scored them all and the single best scoring pose, the top one pose, what percent of the time uh, is that less than two arm misty? That's our metric for success. So in 60, more than 60% of the complexes, uh, it's uh, the top scoring pose is less than two arm misty. And these convolutional neural networks we have implemented and deployed in our Nina docking software. Now, Nina is a fork of Smina, which is a fork of Vina. And so the, the history here is uh, we really like Vina, we're using Vina, but uh, there's several things that are difficult to do or annoying to do in Vina. Um, and so we implemented functionality for more uh, molecular types, for this auto box feature, for um, uh, especially the big thing was uh, a better uh, support for custom scoring functions and scoring functions besides the mean of scoring function, you can just specify a text file, like this is my scoring function and use that. And um, uh, there's one other thing, um, minimization, full support for, support for fully converged minimization. Uh, so SMENA stands for scoring and minimization with autodoc MENA. Uh, but really SMENA is intended to be a better VENA, right? It's um, lightweight and it gives you pretty much the same results. It's just easier to use. With Nina, we want to use all this convolutional neural network stuff. We want to break backwards compatibility. You do not get the same results at all. You get significantly better results, uh, but you also have a program that requires CUDA and lots of other uh, dependencies. It's uh, much uh, harder to build um, and uh, you know it uses a GPU and uh, it's um, uh, we wanted to keep that separate than, than Smina. That's why we forked it again. Uh, and so this has been released as 1.0 and is described and thoroughly evaluated in this paper uh, that Drew wrote. And this is the docking workflow. And it's very similar to, to Vina. You have your input receptor and your input ligand. So you say, this is why I want to dock. And you have to say where I want to dock on the receptor. And one of the uh, features of Smina and Nina, because uh, you know, it's a fork of Smina, is this auto box ligand command line argument. Instead of saying, like specifying out the Cartesian coordinates of this box, which is box, which is somewhat laborious, you can say, here's a ligand, just add four to every side. That's the auto box add, how much do you add on every side? So four angstroms, right? So if you have a cognate structure, you can say, yeah, the ligand bi defines the binding site. Here's the ligand that defines the binding site. And you know it doesn't have to be a ligand, it can just be a bunch of spheres or whatever you want. Uh, to define where the binding site is. You can say, here's the receptors of the binding site, and it'll put a box around it. Right. Uh, so it makes the box definition easier. Okay, so that sets up the task. And then docking is the stochastic process where we're using uh, Monte Carlo chains, uh, where you, know, you randomize the ligand position, you evaluate it, you uh, make a random perturbation, you reevaluate it, you use the metropolis criteria to whether you accept and you know, keep going along this Monte Carlo chain of sampling and accepting, and all the while keeping the best scoring poses. Uh, and this includes a fast refinement step. You're not just uh, not just doing uh, random perturbations. Uh, and all of these Monte Carlo chains happen in parallel. And the number is determined by this exhaustiveness level, which by default is eight. So you can increase the sampling by increasing the exhaustiveness exhaustiveness. The number of steps you take in this chain is determined by this num mc steps command line argument. I don't really recommend you set that because the default is a heuristically set based on how flexible your ligand is. And it, it's a pretty good heuristic. If you want more sampling, increase exhaustiveness. 
Uh, where it can be beneficial is if you want to do quick and dirty dockings and you want to, don't want to get dragged down by uh, it when you have very flexible do uh, ligands, which will take longer, right? So quick and dirty docking, you can set this to a small fixed number. And so you have all these Monte Carlo chains doing all these uh, uh, sampling and keeping track of the best scoring uh, poses. And then you merge them together and the number you keep is this set by this num MC save parameter, which usually you don't need to set. And then you do a full refinement, uh, uh, getting the finding that true local energy minimum. And so you have all of these uh, poses and here you do, finally you do a rescore to come up with a final ranking and you filter out any very similar compounds and take the top num modes, which by default is nine, and that's your output, right? And where the CNN gets inserted here, it, you can choose, right? You can only use it, all of this can be without the very fast autodocbina and just for the final ranking uh, uses the CNN. Uh, you can use it for the refinement because we can actually optimize ligands with respect to our CNN scoring function. Uh, and you can use it to replace Bina throughout all of this, which to be honest, we've never fully evaluated because it's just it's too slow. Um, we don't, like, it's just painful. Uh, and uh, one of the reasons we never really pushed that is uh, this sort of uh, reality is using CNN for refinement. These two black lines, the thick line is uh, using it CNN for the refinement and the thin line is uh, only using it for rescoring. See, they're basically the same line, all right? There's no benefit, which is really sort of disheartening to me because we put all this work into training these CNNs and I wanted them to actually do a better job of not just scoring, but optimizing compounds and they didn't. And so that's sad, but uh, the silver lining and it's a really uh, valuable silver lining is it means there's no benefit to doing it. And so we don't have to spend the computational cost. We can do the cheaper thing and get our screen done faster. Uh, and so uh, just to explain what these graphs are showing, uh, this uh, right at the beginning here, this is the top one. This is if I, I docked and I have my top end poses. And if I just look at the be single best scoring, this is saying about 60% of the time, Bina gets a low RMSD, less than two RMSD pose, and more than 70% of the time the CNN does, right? When redocking, when you have a structure in a ligand, you pull the ligand out and you say, Nina, put this back in. So you already know the answer. A better reflection of what you do, uh, oops, uh, in um, prospective drug discovery is you have a complex with a protein ligand, you pull the ligand out, and then you want to put in other ligands and see if they're better or if they bind at all, right? That's cross docking. And can we can simulate that for all these cases where we have uh, multiple crystal structures of the same protein, but with different ligands. So you have uh, same protein, structure A, structure B, uh, you pull out ligand A and you dock it to receptor B and you dock ligand B to receptor A, right? Uh, and so this cross docking task you can see is much harder. We do much worse and so does Vena, you know, more like 25% success, top one success rate. And, uh, you know, I don't know, 35 or 37% for CNN, but still CNN is doing better, right? Uh, and of course, if you're willing to just say, well, getting the right answer in the top three is my metric for success, then you know, it can only improve. Uh, so that's our default ensemble if you just run Nina with no options. Where that came from is we trained uh, these two models, default 2018 and dense on uh, different training sets, uh, uh, different data sets. Uh, and, and for each one, we trained it five times. So we have an ensemble of five models. So we have like uh, 20 models, independent models here. Uh, and you can see the individual ensembles are all better than Bina, right? Uh, but when we put all 20 models together, that's this green line, which is across the top. Uh, and it's uh, basically underneath the black line. Uh, it does the best, you know, more models ensembling together is better, uh, but that's really expensive valuing 20 CNN models. So what we did is we came up with this, uh, we greedily selected individual models uh, to include this default ensemble that where we have this criteria, oh, we want everything to fit within four gigabytes of GPU memory. We want to approach the performance of uh, the all ensemble using as few models as possible. And so that's what we did. That's the default ensemble. Uh, that's what you get by default. And you can see it does uh, quite well, uh, essentially as well as using all of them, uh, but it's significantly faster. So this on the x-axis is 
your docking performance, how good a job you're doing with docking, your top 1% you want to be higher. And the y-axis is your docking performance, how long it takes to do the docking. So in C on average, we're talking you know, 25 seconds or something like that for a docking with Vina. And then you have this Pareto optimal curve, right? Where you can, you know, getting better along some dimension, it can, I'm slower, but I'm uh, uh, or better, right? Sort of thing. And you can see the uh, default ensemble is right where you want to be. It's as good as possible, but it's not any slower than it needs to be, right? So that, I mean, that's why uh, we picked that. And, and you know, just looking at this, you can see, oh, okay, adding the CNN is computationally much more uh, expensive, but it's really only 10% slower overall for docking, which is not, not bad for, I think, for the, the wins you're getting. However, this is if you're running on a GPU. If you are unfortunate enough not to have a GPU, I recommend you get one, but good luck with that. Uh, and you're running on a CPU, instead of being 10% slower, it's closer to being 10 times slower. Um, that is the nature of deep learning. Okay, so uh, if you're doing docking with Nina or really Vina or Smina, probably the single most important parameter after the receptor ligand in box is uh, the exhaustiveness, right? This controls the amount of sampling. It's the number of Monte Carlo chains you're doing. Uh, so the question is, does increasing this help much? And it turns out the default of eight is pretty good uh, for a normal binding site. Uh, actually with Vina scoring, it doesn't seem to matter a whole much, uh, but with the CNN, you know, you get some benefit from going higher, but um, not a, a real huge amount, right? So the, the dashed lines here are Vina and the um, solid lines are using the CNN, right? So it's really diminishing returns uh, after the default. And you know, doing twice as much sampling is twice as much computation. Uh, if you have 16 cores, it's not gonna take twice as long, but uh, it's still twice as much computation. However, uh, the place where this is less true, there's not, you don't really see as much diminishing returns is when you're doing whole protein docking, right? This is where we define the binding site box, the docking box to envelop the whole protein, which can do really easily, just say auto box protein, auto box ligand, and give it the protein structure. And now you're docking against the entire protein, right? Uh, this is a much larger space. It requires more sampling. And, you know, we've gone up to exhaustive 64, even higher. You, you keep doing better, uh, measurably so, especially with uh, the CNN, right? So if you're doing whole protein docking, our advice is we don't really have a recommended exhaustiveness. It's just a question of how much are you willing to wait and then wait that long, use, the, you, you use that level of exhaustiveness. Uh, but one thing I really like about these graphs, so again, the dashed line are Vina and the solid are uh, CNN. As you look carefully, you can see that uh, Vina at the highest exhaustiveness level we did here, 64, is essentially matching the performance of the CNN at the default eight. So yes, the CNN is slower, especially if you don't have a GPU, but to get the same performance, uh, uh, quality of results as Vina, you would have had to have done eight times as much sampling on Vina. So it's not as bad as it seems. One thing you might ask is what about flexible docking? So all of this was assuming a rigid receptor. The ligand's flexible, but we're not moving the receptor. That of course is another thing that significantly uh, increases uh, the search space. Uh, but it, currently, it, is it's implemented in Nina right now? I definitely don't recommend doing what I call blind flexible docking, right? And that's what we're doing here, uh, where uh, we say uh, similar to the auto box ligand, we have flex bit disc ligand, which specify which is a ligand we're going to use to specify which parts of the receptor should be flexible, right? So you specify this ligand and you specify a flex disc. And what this is saying is any side chain, receptor side chain that is within 3.5 angstroms of any atom in lig.pdb, I'm going to make flexible, right? We only do side chain flexibility, no backbone flexibility, but we let this side chain, you know, the, the rotatable bonds rotate, right? So this is saying, okay, the whole binding site is flexible. When you do this, 
uh, as it turns out, basically it doesn't help me and it takes a lot longer. And so let me walk you through these graphs. Uh, what we're doing is we are doing cross docking, right? So uh, we have the binding site we're docking to, and we know what the cognate binding site of the ligand that we're docking looks like, right? They're different, right? Uh, and so we can calculate how different the binding site residues are. That's what this y-axis is here, the RMSD between what we're docking to, to what sort of the ideal receptor for the ligand we're docking is. Right? And one thing to notice is in most cases, it's pretty small, under two, right? So you don't actually, so just sort of sampling from the PDD, uh, looking at similarly uh, identical proteins that have been crystallized, uh, not big differences in the binding site. Uh, and so what this means is you're already starting with something that's close to the answer, and then you're enabling flexibility, which means uh, you're letting your docking software get farther away from the correct answer. And I think this hurts you. As you can see, for all of these cases, what this is showing um, down here is the improvement that enabling flexibility gives you. So this is zero. So actually, in all of these cases, you would better off not doing flexible docking whatsoever. And then sometimes when things are fairly different, uh, there have been cases where you see improvements. Right? So, But uh, for the most part, not a big difference either way. Uh, but it's sort of skewed towards don't do flexible. The exception, uh, and we just have anecdotal evidence over this, is when you are choosing specific intelligently selected residues. So you have your binding site and there's a floppy arginine in there. It's like, you look at it like clearly this thing should be able to move. And so then you can very easily with Nina say, okay, make those residues flexible. So flex res, chain A, residue 84, boom, it's flexible and chain A residue 88. That's all you have to do, right? So target specific residues. Uh, and then, uh, at least anecdotally, that can uh, be beneficial. But don't willy-nilly turn everything, make everything flexible. It's just giving you more opportunities to sample the wrong answer. Okay, so uh, just as a reminder, with the CNN model, you, you, it is scoring the ligand, what actually comes out are two scores. There is uh, the pose score, which we call CNN score. That is a number between zero and one. That is uh, supposed to be a probability this is a good low RMSD pose. So you want it to be one. And the other number that comes out is the CNN affinity, which is a prediction of binding affinity. And so what you can see here is uh, where we're asking a question, does this, the, the value of the score have any meaning, right? So uh, if I only consider the cases where I have a high scoring pose, uh, does it mean I'm more likely to be successful? And that's what this is saying. Like if I only look at the cases where my top scoring pose was uh, 0.8 or better, uh, then 80% of the time in redocking, yes, that is a good pose. So that's an improvement over the 75% or whatever. And similar with cross docking, if uh, you're cross docking, you get a 0.8 or better score, then uh, you're you go from like a little under 40 to a little under 60 percent. So you have more confidence. Now, unfortunately, uh, the number of times you actually get a really high score when cross docking is much less because you know it's not a perfect fit. Um, but if you're doing a screen or doing a docking, you see these high scores that should give you some more confidence that this is in fact good. But if it's a low score, it could still be good, still 40 percent or something. All right, so finally, I think a lot of what people want to know is how does this, how well does it work with virtual screening? Now, to be honest, uh, I do have never prospectively done a high throughput docking virtual screen. It just seems like a lot of computation to spend uh, when you could spend a little effort designing a few intelligent pharmacophores, do the matching, and really radically reduce the size of uh, the set you're screening. Uh, that's what we tend to do. Uh, but you might want to do a docking screen. And so we've done this retrospectively using these two data sets, DUDE and LitPCBA. And so each dot here is a different target. And you can see we're looking at Vena and Venardo, uh, which is a optimized version of Vena, which is also available in Nina and Smina. You can just enable it. Uh, you can see it does better. Uh, so this is the EF1%. So this is the enrichment factor of the top one percent ranked compounds. 
right? So, you know, median performance more than 10x in richness, that's not bad. Uh, and then, the, but the CNN does even better. And uh, generally, the affinity score is better than the post score, though they're pretty close. Um, so, if you look at just at these numbers, uh, the dense, that most computationally challenging network tends to do the best. Uh, but the default does very well in, in italics here. These are all the enrichment, the median enrichment for these benchmarks. In italics, uh, if it's in italics, it means it's not an actually, even though this is you know, 20 to 15 seems significant, statistically speaking, this is not a significant uh, difference. Right? Uh, so most of these are, are similar. Uh, one thing to note is uh, the dude uh, benchmark and lip PCBA have very different um, results. Uh, the lip PCBA is much more challenging. If you look at this RF score VS, it was actually trained on dude and it does extremely well. But then when you evaluate it on a benchmark, it was not trained on. It is the worst. Uh, all of our models were not trained on dude or lip PCBA. What they're trained on, in fact, they're not trained for virtual screening at all. What they're trained to do is to evaluate this pose quality and predict the binding affinity, right? Uh, we haven't shown it any uh, decoys, any inactive contents. It hasn't been trained on this virtual screening task. And yet it's doing very, very well, as you can see. Uh, and just down here, this is the normalized uh, EF 1%. Uh, enrichment factor has this issue where uh, the value itself depends on the ratio of actives and decoys in the training set. So you can't compare an enrichment factor from one target to another one but you can normalize it. And so here, these are all comparable. And uh, the little line down here is, would be no enrichment, just uh, random performance. You can see we're pretty much always above it. Uh, the, the vertical lines are the 95% confidence intervals, right? So uh, we're doing quite well on dude and even on uh, lip PCBA relative to random, right? So I do think this can be used. Again, it's a, it's a exercise in enrichment, not perfection though. All right, so finally, how do you go about doing this? We have, if you go to the website, uh, we have a sample CoLab notebook where you can just run Nina, you just run the cells and, and you're done. You don't have to install anything. Uh, and uh, CoLab lets you use a GPU. So if you don't have a GPU, you can use Google's, so that's nice. Um, you, you download it and you just uh, run a command line like this. And so you can check out, go ahead and check out this uh, CoLab notebook. This is a live link in the PDF. Um, the, the link to the PDF was at the, the beginning. Um, and uh, it includes this visualization of the docking results, which is, is animated in the actual notebook. Uh, so uh, feel free to check that out. And if you want to install it, uh, everything I'm talking about is uh, of our tools is uh, open source uh, under um, either an Apache or a new license. Uh, the, the new license is mostly there because we use Open Babel a lot. And, and so anything that links to Open Babel has to use a new license. Um, so uh, you can get Nina from GitHub. Uh, farm it, although most people just use a web server. If you want to spin up your own version, if you want to have your proprietary library, uh, one thing I didn't mention, you can submit your own libraries to farm it. So if you don't mind it being hosted on our servers, you, you don't have to do any work really. Um, uh, but you can download and install your own web server for that. Uh, LibMulgrid, uh, Smina, uh, 3DMLJS is how we're doing all this visualization in the browser. Uh, and finally, I just want to do a quick plug for this SD sorter, very simple utility. Uh, it's just if you've ever wanted to sort and filter SD uh, files based on the contents of the SD molecules of the molecule uh, SD data of the molecules, uh, and uh, you want it to be fast, uh, you can you might want to check this out. All right, so just in conclusion, I want to uh, thank uh, the many group members who contributed to what I've talked about. Uh, Drew did the uh, wrote the Nina paper and did all the evaluations for Nina 1.0. Uh, Jocelyn's been a very productive member in the, in the groups now graduated um, and it's at DSHA Research, uh, did a lot of the Libmul grid and GPU computing. Uh, Matt uh, was at the start of the project, did a lot of the uh, initial work evaluating and training CNNs and coming up with ideas. Uh, Paul uh, did the cross doc set. Um, Jonathan Tomahide contributed, contributed uh, various ways as well. And Rocco is, is, did all the flexible docking analysis and still working on it, hopefully uh, you know, making it better so we can change our uh, advice in terms of whether we should use it or not. Uh, and all, all these names on the right here uh, were undergrads or high school students who've actually materially uh, contributed uh, to this project. So uh, thank you for listening. Um, 
at this point you must have watched on YouTube and uh, I hope I uh, sounded okay at one and a half speed. Bye.